So here we are. And I'm very happy to have with us today Professor James Morley, uh, which is a professor of clinical psychology at Ramapo College of New Jersey, where he has served as a faculty president and teaches psychopathology, phenomenological psychology, and social theory. Professor Morley is the editor in chief of the Journal of Phenomenological Psychology, was founding director Rumpel's Mindfulness Center and is the past president of the Interdisciplinary Coalition of North American Phenomenology. Professor Morley's publications and research interests are in the philosophical foundations of psychology as a human science and the application of phenomenological thought to research methodology and topics such as imagination, mental health, and meditation practice. EcoEdit detects Meloponti, Interiority and Exteriority, published by Sunny Press in 1999, and with James Phillips, a collection of essays titled Imagination and its Pathologies for the Myth Press, published in 2003. James, thank you for being with us. It's a very great pleasure for me to have you. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, this the whole idea for this talk grew out of these marvelous conversations that uh, Francesca and I and many other people had at a conference in Cyprus this summer. And uh, we, we were talking about how, you know, um, all these debates we have in phenomenology, uh, they're all healthy and good. And, and uh, it, it pushes things forward to have debates. But um, a lot of the issues would be solved if we actually paid more attention to pedagogy. So what we all agree is that phenomenology is uh, outside of philosophy can get watered down and the rigor and the quality of the, uh, of the work can become you know, a, a problematic. And you know, so what's the answer to that? And so there's all kinds of debates about how to do well, phenomenology outside of uh, philosophy and, and particularly in qualitative research. And, uh, and, and they've gone back and forth the last couple of years and it's been actually really wholesome. And I've always in, I've enjoyed this very much because it puts questions forward. But um, I, I, I really wonder, and I, we were thinking about this and I've talked with the Supreme people, if the issue is just, you know, maybe we're just teaching it badly. Maybe we're just uh, not getting right how to, how, to, how to transfer this approach to uh, knowledge in, in, a, in a more accurate way. So um, I've been teaching, uh, first of all, my background, I, I'm very lucky to have been trained in phenomenology in a really good way. I was part of a curriculum. When I went to graduate school, there was a curriculum that supported me. And uh, we actually learned, uh, we learned uh, phenomenological research in, in a psychology department at Duquesne University at a, time when the program was completely phenomenological. So every course in psychology was phenomenologized. And so I, I'm very lucky to have this. And then over the years as an instructor, uh, I've been teaching mostly undergraduate students and mostly undergraduate students that have had no background in any philosophy whatsoever. So I've been on the forward front lines here and I've had to figure out how to teach uh, students that have never read a text of philosophy and probably never will but yet how to accurately uh, transmit what phenomenology is. So that's kind of what this came out of. And I've also got to say in terms of intellectual property rights, I, you know, my thoughts are not my own and whatever I've learned as a teacher, I really owe to my friends and colleagues with whom I've been talking. Uh, and uh, it's Scott Churchill is the master when it comes to uh, pedagogy for phenomenological methodology outside of uh, philosophy. Scott's been doing this probably more intensely and over more time than anyone alive. And uh, of course, uh, and also I have to say my colleague uh, uh, Magnus Englander has also a huge range of experience in teaching both phenomenological method and also empathy training uh, in, uh, in his, his work. And he's taught me a lot and I've learned from him as well. So let me be clear here, these thoughts are not all my own. They come from who, I'm hang who I hang out with. So here goes, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about, first, let's get clear, what do we mean by phenomenology? And then, you know, what are the disciplinary issues when it comes to teaching? Uh, 
then what's the problem with the with the pedagogical material we work with the problem with the text and how to how to finally the issue is how to do phenomenology how to practice phenomenology using the insights of uh, experiential pedagogy and of course the irony here is that phenomenology is a and I'll repeat myself many times phenomenology is an experiential science yet we don't use an experiential pedagogy. We use primarily a conceptual pedagogy. That's a throwback to the old days. And uh, it's kind of ironic that we don't teach ex the science of experience in an experiential way. And I think we need to think about this. I also wanna say that there's other people that are thinking and operating pedagogically uh, very, very close to the way I do. And I think microphenomenology, uh, Claire petit Mignon's work with microphenomenology is very experiential. And I have to say that, that, so she gets that too. She's also using a very experiential approach. So, you know, everything I say also happens. I've attended many microphenomological workshops and this, this same kind of practice orientation is going on there. And I think we need to pay attention to, to what Claire is doing. All right, so then I'm gonna conclude with sort of concretely how I work in the classroom with trying to teach uh, phenomenology. Uh, through uh, both uh, descriptions, interviews, and most importantly, elucidating meanings from descriptions from within the phenomenological attitude. So the idea here is that we teach the phenomenological attitude by practicing the elucidation of descriptions. So we, practice, we teach it that way, and that's going to be it. So let me get into it. So um, what is phenomenology? And uh, you know, no one has a definition for what phenomenology is, and any definition you give will cause controversy. Uh, so uh, one searches for a definition that uh, would please most people. And uh, I, I always uh, enjoy going to the preface to uh, Milliponti's Phenomenology Perception. I find that a very be beautiful place to start. Um, I also like going to Husserl's Ideas One, and he, there he uses this, he uses the expression, the principle of all principles. And um, that's exactly the same thing that Merleau-Ponty means in the primacy of perception. When he uh, gave his inaugural uh, speech lecture at Culture de France, he, he spoke of the primacy of perception at the basic thesis of phenomenology. And, I, and this is Husserl's principle of all principles or the theory of direct intuition. And what that simply says is that, uh, uh, we believe that uh, as phenomenologists that uh, the world comes prior to thinking, prior to constructs, uh, it's pre-categorical, it's lived. And so the primacy of lived experience is the, is the ultimate source of all knowledge, logic, and reason. Uh, so I think that's a safe definition. I don't know if anyone would disagree with that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, what I wanna get into here is that to get to direct intuition, it's easy to say that, but to get to direct intuition of the world and, and the things of the world, and even myself and other people, uh, you need a method. So that's what Mo Husserl came up with as a method. And Meloponti backs that up. He says very clearly, you can't get into phenomenology without grasping the method. And the method is really an approach. It's a mindset. It's a worldview. It's a, it's a set and setting, so to speak. Uh, and uh, you've got to get into this approach to understand any of the concepts. Of course, the approach led to concepts, but to understand the concepts, you've got to take the approach. And this approach is, you know, the, the epoch, uh, the reductions and eidetic analysis. And uh, I just don't have a problem with that. I, I don't know what the fuss is. You know, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very clear across Husserl's writing. It's very clear in Meloponti's work. It's very clear in most phenomenologists that they do something like this. And this is not in any way opposed to hermeneutics. Most philosophers agree that it's absolutely complementary to theories of interpretation. They both complement each other. Uh, but uh, for right now, I'm just keeping to the basics. So um, here's the thing. So to get to the to get to what phenomena is about, there's a method. And I want to make this point very clear. Uh, some people think you can just teach the concepts of phenomenology, like intersubjectivity, or the lived body, or intentionality, or co-constitution, existential. They, you know, these are concepts that are uh, come out of the research of phenomenological philosophers. And I argue vehemently that I don't think you can grasp these concepts if you're still in the natural attitude. It's, there's just no way out of this. Uh, 
I, you know, I, when 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 some people take up phenomenological concepts without grasping the attitude that 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 it, that means that it somehow steps back from the natural attitude, um, things go wrong very quickly. And you see this in the literature when people use these concepts in a reductivistic way or in a scientific way. It just things go wonky. And this and especially this happens in qualitative research all the time. They still have an empiricist worldview uh, while using phenomenological concepts. They, there's a paradigm problem there. So I, I would say very strongly that you you know you've got the method and the concepts, you know, are in a reversible relationship. They 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 need each other. It's a yin and yang, so to speak. They 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 construct each other. So uh, the method's very important, and uh, the concepts and the method. Are, are one thing you have to see as a unity. Um, now, so this is why the epoche is really important. And again, I understand there's all kinds of fuss about the epoche. Uh, people say that the epoche is, is presupposing some universal bird's eye perspective on reality. And that's just not true. Yeah, it gets used that way sometimes, but the epoche is modified when we step outside of uh, philosophical phenomenology. We, the epoche is always modified. And I'm not inventing this. Alfred Schutz, is, the whole span of Alfred Schutz's work is about uh, uh, the modified epoche in the service of understanding the social world. And all of Merleau-Ponty is uh, involved in embodying this same modification of the epoche. So no, we don't use the epoche for the purposes of transcendental phenomenology, uh, although there's nothing wrong with that. We, and we sort of want to understand that. But the epoch gets modified. And this is particularly in the case of phenomenological psychology, which is what Husserl, Husserl wrote about this psychological epoch, uh, uh, because he really endorsed the foundation of a, of a science, of a, a non-philosophical science that would be based on his theory of thinking. So, so this is not new, but this is a very important thing to say from the onset. When we step outside of the discipline of philosophy, we're dealing with another kind of epoch. And the difference is this, and I'll repeat myself here. The, uh, the epoch for a transcendental phenomenon is done for the purpose of ultimately bracketing out your own self and going beyond the psychological, okay? The epoch for the non-philosopher is done for the purpose of studying the natural attitude itself. You see, so we're so again, it's a phenomenology of the natural attitude, and the epoch here is one where I step out of the natural attitude to see the natural attitude and to study the natural attitude. But to do so, I must always reimmerse myself in the natural attitude. There's no escape from this. So it's a weaving, and I like Merleau-Ponty's term entrelac. Okay, a weaving back and forth, a sewing back and forth, and that's the meaning of the epoch when used outside of uh, phenomenological philosophy, and that's how we teach it as a way of stepping back, but jumping back and going back and forth all the time. And the, um, the articulation we have for this, again, it comes from Miloponti's notion of figure ground, shifting your conscious back and forth, in and out of the phenomenological attitude and back into the experience of other people and my own experience in the natural attitude. So the natural attitude is very important. And this is what we teach as uh, uh, phenomenological teachers. We're teaching how to look at the natural attitude, how to, how to own my natural attitude, how to recognize it somehow, and and then uh, and then step step into the natural attitude while also coming out again. And the metaphor of the field anthropologist is very helpful here. Uh, the field anthropologist is working with the uh, Torrey Band Islanders, okay, or the or the people in New Guinea. And they become, they learn the language and live as, a, as tribes people and they're living, they move their huts into the village and they live with them. And they, they become uh, members of the tribe. And, and, but yet at the same time, they're always still stepping back and being social scientists. They're still anthropologists, they're still studying them. So they're doing both things at once. Uh, and that's what we are doing in non philosophical, not applied phenomenology. We're going into the world, but also and we're in it, but not of it. We're out of it and in it. And that's the trickiness here. And that's the whole, that's what makes the pedagogy very difficult, okay? Is teaching this very tricky position of looking at the natural attitude and stepping out of it at the same time, which is the essence of the, uh, of the psychological epoche, or the, you could call it the social science epoche if you want. So, um, so now again, 
Uh, it's been suggested by some that we should not bother teaching the FOK uh, in uh, uh, outside of philosophy because people can't get it and uh, people can't understand it because they're not trained in philosophy. And I don't, that's not said to be condescending. I don't think that it's, that's not the intention, okay? The intention is just that the idea here is that if people don't have a background in philosophy, they're not gonna understand this. So try to find a way to teach phenomenology without demanding this of them. And uh, my response is that no, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not, if, if there is any one thing you want to teach, students it is itself the epoch okay, that which is most difficult doesn't mean just because it is so difficult to teach to non-philosophers doesn't mean you should back away from this project uh, if you're in a storm you sail into the storm to get out of the storm you don't avoid it or it'll just chase you forever so uh so i think that it is really really incumbent upon us in our pedagogy to really actually focus on the epoch okay and just do it better. And just because people haven't been grasping it, and it is hard to grasp, doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, avoid it. We need to buckle down and just do a better job at it. So, um, all right, now a few more things about interdisciplinarity uh, before I jump into this. Uh, so again, it's really clear, uh, method is not the turf of philosophers alone. Okay, method belongs to all the disciplines that can apply it. However, all the disciplines need to modify the method in, in, you, in a way that is unique to their discipline. So um, number one, you got to know your students. Yeah, just like any good teacher, you got to know your students. Okay. Uh, and most importantly, what are their needs? And what are their projects? What are they up to? What is their existential part? What is their <laughs> um, in order to motive? Okay. So that's the number one thing you got to know, just like with any teacher. And uh, you have to know what is their curricular background. So uh, in philosophy, students have been, you know, been living on a diet of uh, uh, of Kant and Hume and uh, and uh, you know and and Hegel. Okay, okay. If you're if you're if getting a diet of these kinds of thinkers, the epoche is not going to be a difficult thing to understand. Okay, uh, but. Uh, for non-philosophers and, and for people who have had no philosophy, it's a very different matter. So again, in the arts, and I'll just quickly go, in the arts, interestingly enough, uh, people are pretty quick at understanding uh, this gestalt switch of consciousness that goes on, because uh, that's the arts are all about uh, practicing their own kind of epoch all the time. They, they live this in the creative process. So they understand this very quickly. It's also, it's also true of people who meditate, people who have a meditation practice, they get this because they understand the gestalt switch in consciousness. You go back and forth in different ways of seeing the world. This intellectual flexibility is built into meditators, as well as people who are practicing artists. Now in the humanities, you also get a bit of this. Humanities are easier to teach phenomenology because uh, they are thinking in a, a flexible way that, that is requested of them in the humanities. When you get to the social sciences, though, things get mixed. And you got to know this because you got to know what's the curriculum behind uh, the learning and how can you develop a scaffolding? So in the social sciences, it's mixed. It really depends. You got to really get in there and, and find out what's going on because the social sciences can be taught just as uh, can be just as empiricist as the physical sciences. And of course, we know that people coming from the physical sciences are going to, you know, physical sciences is uh, is, is the natural attitude on steroids. It's all about the, it is the natural, it is the method of the natural attitude. And uh, now people can get out of this if they're in, just because you're in the physical sciences doesn't mean you can't do phenomenology. That's ridiculous. Of course you can, but it does take some work sometimes with some people to understand this. And then of course, you've got uh, the issues of personality. Some people have personalities that aren't as flexible as others. So there's, there's these issues too, you gotta keep in mind. And finally, there's the professions like nursing and uh, psycho psychology and social work. Okay, these applied professions. Here, um, again, there's lots of practical demands. And uh, there's, a, there's a kind of utilitarian, not in the bad sense, but pragmatic concerns. And you gotta be aware of that. And you have to be able to uh, teach them in, in, a, in a way that, that meets these needs. So, okay, so, so that's, that's that. Um, it's, you gotta know about the curriculum. And 
Another thing is uh, wherever you're teaching, you have to understand the curriculum behind you. What's the institution's curriculum with regard to uh, philosophy and uh, how ideas are taught? Okay, it's really important to know. What is the, some institutions are strictly almost scientific. Some institutions have no room for, uh, for anything outside of, of science and can be actually scientific and very difficult to work in. All right, enough. So now another problem is the uh, texts for teaching phenomenology. And here we're, we've got a lot of problems, okay? Now, uh, in philosophy, you can tell a student, here's the phenomenology of perception, go read it, come back. Here's being in time, read it, come back. Here's ideas, here's the crisis, read this. Uh, you can't do that outside of philosophy. You can't just throw a book at them and tell them to read it. And that's, that's how you teach phenomenology. Um, now, the text of the secondary literature is very problematic. And I don't want to be harsh, but there's a lot a lot of the secondary literature is secondary literature commenting on secondary literature, commenting on secondary literature. And this is how things get really watered down. And a lot of misinformation is out there in the secondary literature. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it's very hard to clean this up uh, with, in a way that is gentle and kind. You know, it's, so it's tough. Uh, now there are, and I know every one of them, there are some really nice books that have been written uh, to meet this challenge. Uh, I think we've got, uh, I, I could spend the whole time talking about these books, but the one that I like a lot, and I'm very prejudiced here, is my friend Scott Churchill's book, okay, uh, on doing, exist he calls it uh, Existential Phenomenology Research, where his, uh, he's able, he's speaking to people that have had no philosophy, and he's teaching phenomenology in a very practical way. So it's a really great, it just came out recently, a little plug for Scott's book. But there's other books too, and one in particular, and I'll stop there, is, a, is one uh, by David Detmer called Phenomenology Explained, okay? And it's a really nice book for um, non-science, humanities-oriented students. Now, there's several other books that are written for science students, and that's Sean Gallagher. I think Dan Zahavi's book is good for that, okay? And there's a couple of others that are directed towards cognitive scientists. But uh, so they're there but they're still tough for students who are undergraduates uh, or even graduate students. So, and again, nothing, the books by themselves aren't going to teach phenomenology. It's, it, as I'm arguing, it's the practice of phenomenology that's gonna help them really get this. So again, the books are necessary, but not sufficient. And that's the key to this. Another really lovely book is uh, Ed Casey's book, Imagining, okay? And, uh, and also anything by Sartre. Sartre is very accessible to, uh, to uh, people with no background in phenomena. Sartre's amazing. Not Meloponte, but Sartre. Okay, so let's get to the doing here. Now, um, again, the, the ideas here are, are coming not just from phenomenology, but also from John Dewey. Uh, John Dewey is an American uh, philosopher, who a pragmatist, and he's very simpatico with everything we do as phenomenologists. And to, he came up with this notion. He, he said, you know, he said, hey, you know, the... Um, um, he was looking at the in the 30s and saying, look, there's these totalitarian authoritarian governments all over the world. But look at it in America, we say we're democratic, but we teach in a very authoritarian um, way. And he says, we need to change the way we teach if we're going to breed people who are citizens in a democracy. So that's his motive. But it's also very funny. He basically said, don't get up there and make them memorize concepts. Instead, have them do research have them be actively engage in the knowledge gathering process. It's in the research, in the doing of, of seeking knowledge that knowledge happens. And this is beautiful. It's a real spirit of scientific inquiry, which is to discover ideas, not just copy ideas from somebody else. So this is the key idea we're operating with here for uh, teaching phenomenology. Let's practice it instead of just memorizing concepts. So, um, uh, and that also, this makes sense because the the theory of I, theory of direct intuition is anti conceptual, is anti uh, cognitive. It says that you know direct experience comes before cognition. So why are we using cognition to teach direct experience? Again, I'm repeating myself. So how to practice the epoch? How to do this? Again, I spoke of how we have to modify it. Okay, we're not, it's not just for the purposes of transcendental research. And again, we turned to Alfred Schutz and Meloponti for this idea. And how to, the issue is how to teach students to recognize the natural attitude uh, 
And uh, again, it's about going in and out, how to go in and out, how to develop this uh, flexibility, this kind of existential flexibility that takes all of you, not just your brain, okay? Um, and I call this how to practice this gestalt switch, the gestalt switch back and forth between one, one point of view and another. Alfred Schutz calls this the shock that happens when you go from one region of meaning to another. He calls it a shock, and it is a shock, like when you wake up in the morning from a dream. It's a shock, okay? Or when you get bad news that just makes you see your life in its totality. It's a shock. And so how to practice this shock in a methodological way. Now, again, the quality we're looking for is a certain tolerance of ambiguity, okay? It's, it's, it's a personality trait in psychology, but it's a quality that we really need if we're going to do phenomenology. Phenomenology really requires a tolerance for ambiguity, and this is what you want to embody as a teacher, this capacity to enter into the ambiguous without looking for premature closure, okay? Look, look, well, looking for a concept without naming it, without diagnosing it, you know, without uh, theorizing it. How to go in there and just be in the, in the muck, how to just stay with that as much as possible. And this is exactly this figure ground weaving process that we're trying to, trying to do. So, okay, now we're gonna get more concrete. And uh, I may need a little help with putting things up on the slide. It's, I, I always make to, make to mess this up. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a PowerPoint kind of person, but I have a couple of things to put up perhaps depending on how much time I have. So um, number one, I found it really great to start by teaching description. Now, um, it doesn't go on. Okay, I don't know that uh, uh, people get taught this, but teaching description is like having, uh, and it's a wonderful, it's a fun thing to do. It's kind of like doing, it's, it's like an art workshop or a poetry workshop, where, except that you're doing this in a sort of, a sort of scientific phenomenological attitude. But teaching description is really important. Uh, so I have great fun with this. And I, I have learned to uh, I begin the course by teaching descriptions. So I will have students uh, describe an inanimate natural object. Um, sometimes if there's a full moon, I'll ask the students to describe the full moon, which is a good one, okay? Or uh, if there's something going on in the sky that night, I'll have them describe that. Or just something, an inanimate object that is part of nature. <clears throat> and they are to do descriptions. So I spend a lot of time <clears throat> coaching them on what makes a description full versus weak, and how to how to how to uh, what what does description mean? Means using lots of adjectives, using metaphors, you know, how to work to do descriptions. And that's kind of like a writing workshop when you take that approach. But it's very important for them to learn that their power to describe, okay, that and and to get on into the into the point of view of the describing person. Um, once they begin to understand from the uh, first person perspective, what it's like to describe, they will then become better interviewers later, okay? Because they'll understand um, how to get to that more descriptive place when they're, when they're uh, interviewing their, their participants. So uh, I start with inanimate objects, then we move to plants, which is a really interesting thing to do. And then we go to animals, and sometimes people will describe pets and there'll be wild animals. And there's a lot to talk about in the difference between a pet and a wild animal. It's, a, it's always a fascinating discourse, okay? And then we move to people. And once we get into describing people, it's a whole new ball game. And uh, it's, uh, we start with describing strangers on the street. And then we get to describing people that we know personally. And we talk about the difference going on there in terms of our access, our empathic access to, to them in two different modalities. So um, again, this is important uh, pedagogically because you, know, you want to know the difference between a weak and a strong description. What is a full description? It's sort of like what Husserl says about, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, uh, he talks about full and strong intuitions. Okay, and we're really operating in that same way. And does, you can you can almost take the word intuition and replace it with description sometimes here. So uh, so again, this makes for good interview. First, start with doing first person descriptions, okay, and then the interviews come. Now, interviewing uh, is uh, you know there's there's a lot of prissiness about interviewing. What's the right way to interview? And Magnus and I have been very clear 
uh, that uh, there is no one way to do an interview because the interview must adapt to the phenomenon. The, the, the phenomenon should come first. Every phenomenon has its own mode of access. And we need to use data, when we collect data, we need to find uh, the mode of access most appropriate for that phenomenon. Okay. So the interview will vary uh, depending on how we do this. And um, so the th key thing here, again, this is something taught to me by, by my friends, is to first see an expert or experienced interviewer do an interview. The students need that. They first need to see an expert doing an interview. And so when they, <laughs> calling myself an expert, okay. Um, so they'll see me do a, a couple of interviews with students. Then they do interviews with each other. And it's really important that they have the point of view of being a participant, being interviewed, and also the interviewer doing it. Again, these, it's very important they switch roles and they understand both points of view before they go on and do any uh, research on their own. So there's a lot you can say about it, teaching interviews and, and getting it right. It's a very delicate art and science. And uh, it's, uh, and again, uh, you know, what, are you in or out of the natural attitude when you're doing an interview is open for debate, okay? Uh, you know, I, it's, 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 uh, uh, it, I'm not always sure whether I can get out of the natural attitude when I'm doing an interview because I've got a clearer world project going on. It's an open for debate and I don't have a position on that. Um, I suspect that my phenomenological position is always informing me, okay? And there's things I need to put, suspend or put out of, put into an, suspended animation when I'm in there. Um, uh, uh, but it's important that students at least enter into the, the, the problems here, that they have the experience of it. So um, another thing is uh, now, now I want to switch to the meat of my uh, presentation, which is uh, the, what, what we call data analysis. I prefer to call uh, explicating meanings. Okay, that'd be my, my preferred term for it. But in data uh, analysis, we're taking descriptions and then we're working with them. Now, number one, concretely and practically, uh, you, you can't give students a whole interview a 60 page interview or a 30 page interview or 10 page interview to analyze. You can't do that. It just doesn't work pedagogically. What works is what they, uh, what we, I learned to do at Duquesne and, uh, and, and Scott taught me to do as well with my students, which is to use brief first person protocol descriptions, just written descriptions, a very simple uh, uh, description. Now, um, descriptions can be full or weak. Okay, a, 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 a bad description is still can be analyzed. Okay, and a full description, of course, is easier to analyze, more fun to analyze, but a weak description is still giving you lots of material when you're in the phenomenological attitude. So, um, Steen Halling at uh, uh, Seattle University actually developed a whole method out of this, uh, uh, what I'm about to talk to you about. He calls it uh, dialogal, the dialogal method of uh, data analysis where he'd get a group of people in a room and they would all read the same transcript or data and then they'd all discuss it together. So they do the data analysis as a group, okay? There's issues with that and, and issues with uh, not just a, a thought, uh, you know, uh, copywriting issues and all this, but, but there's the problem of group dynamics and leaders taking charge and all that. So there's an issue there. But uh, in a classroom situation, and here I'm not talking about this as a research method, I'm talking about this as pedagogy, in a classroom situation, this is where things really open up. And this is, as a teacher, I have been very inspired to see uh, my students just wake up and come to life when uh, we do the protocol analysis in the classroom. And uh, so, uh, and I've been trained in the uh, Duquesne existential phenomenological psychological method and uh, which, which is a method that I have kind of come home to. I've learned other methods, of course, um, but I keep coming home to the one that I was originally, it's like your birth religion, you know, it's your own, you're, you're, you, you remember it. And I, uh, it, 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 this is the method started by Georgie and it's really come to life for me as a teacher because, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, disdain Georgie's method because it's so rigorous. You know, you 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 take the whole transcript, you break it into parts, and you elucidate each of the parts in separate meaning units, and then put it back together identically into a new whole. Um, I, I just find it very sensible. It's a whole part, whole. Uh, that's what analysis means: is take the whole, make it into parts, put it back together again. Um, uh, but 
uh, and people will have issues with breaking it down in meeting units. Um, and I, I think advanced researchers don't have to follow it so, uh, so exactly once you get advanced. But pedagogically, Georgie's technique of meeting unit analysis is really, really uh, profound. Uh, pedagogically, at least, and whatever you can say about the re for its utility and or, or its over it, its practicality, quality of research, its utility pedagogically has been really interesting to me. And uh, you'll see in a minute if I can put this up there. Basically, we take a brief description from uh, uh, from an anonymous uh, participant, or maybe not anonymous. And we uh, break it into parts. We chunk it, as we say in psychology, into parts. And we read it for the whole, so we get the whole. So we have it there intuitively, horizontally on the background at all times. And then we look at each individual part. So the whole is in the background, horizontally. But we're looking at each part, and we're zooming in on it, like a, metaphorically, like a microscope. Okay, And we're zooming in on it and elucidating it in terms of uh, it's phenomenological, uh, ph phenomenologically. So the idea here is think of it like uh, uh, the phenomenological attitude is like equivalent to meaning uh, as, as a, the telescope or microscope was, you know, uh, to science, okay? It allows us to see things that we normally don't see when we're in the natural attitude. And this is what we're trying to teach. So we look at, break it into parts. Students begin to see what, previously was invisible. And that's the moment of learning. That's when they begin to grasp the epoche. When they concretely see what they couldn't see. And again, I'm there coaching them. I'm like their, their phenomenology coach, so to speak. Um, they do what we put it up on the on the board and we have the parts and we have two columns. There's the column of, of the, the meeting units, which is the parts of the description. And then we have a second column, which is the elucidation column. And I leave it, so first I give them a, a protocol that I have analyzed. So they get a model for how to operate phenomenologically. So you almost don't need to talk about the FOK because you're teaching a way of looking. And you, once you get into the data and, and elucidating it, uh, it speaks for itself. The method speaks for itself. So first I show them how I do it. And I show them uh, how I did my elucidations of all the parts. And then I show them my, what we call situated structure, which is a, one could say it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenologically re-elucidated narrative of what the person experienced from a phenomenological perspective. And then if I can, even from that one description, I will try to now identically pull up a more general structural description of the phenomenon for most, as it would be for most people. So here I'm using my imagination to think, I'm basing it on empirical description of, uh, uh, of the phenomenon. And I look at the parts and then I re-express the description from the phenomenological perspective. And then I say, wow, then I use I, identically, using my imagination, I say, how can I imagine this would be for most people from this perspective? So that's the uh, phenological psychological method uh, in, in a nutshell. So first I show them how it's done. Okay, I don't just throw them in the water and say swim. Show them how it's done. Then we post up another uh, description. And often these are descriptions that the students themselves did in class. And again, a lot of these ideas I got from Scott Churchill. Okay, okay. He showed me how to do this. And I started doing this a couple of years ago and it just began to just work magically in my my classes and it's just so inspiring. So once you get, once you start putting the um, date meaning is up there on the screen, the class comes alive as everybody begins the detective work of elucidating the meaning and coming to terms with it. And you know, students that are not particularly inspired or, uh, or, or intellectually inclined or particularly academically interested, they all get involved in this, okay? Because it's just a, it's it's just it's it's a normal human interest to want to understand how people see things, so they jump in there and it and it really comes alive. So what I can do now is I can if I can if I can pull this off is I'm going to put up a show you just very quick. We're not going to read through it because I don't think we have time. Uh, Francesca, how much time do we have? Um, more or less thirty five minutes. Uh, the seminar should stop at. 30 past six. Okay, 
So uh, I'm going to quickly, so I want to make sure we have time for, uh, for conversation. So all right, I'm, gonna, I'm going to now put on the screen a completed uh, protocol analysis, just to give you an idea of how it works. And then I'm gonna put up an incomplete one and show you how we work within there. I don't know with the Zoom context if we're gonna be able to do a data analysis uh, on, on, uh, together, but we can talk about it later. How's that? All right. Um, so hang on. So here I'm gonna do a completed one. And this is one that was published by Magnus and I in the, uh, uh, the Journal of Phenomenology and Qualitative Research. I have a couple of unpublished ones. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. Here's one that wasn't published. That's just a learning description. It's a description of an experience of learning. And it's a very fun one. And I give it all the time. And um, now, how can I switch screen, share screen? Let me know if this works. Can you share your screen, Jim? Yeah, I'm trying to share my screen. I'm not good at this. I never do this. Well, if you have that kind of Zoom version inside of the bottom of your screen, you can see the demonstration of screen. It's like in my mm -hmm. version, it's a green button with arrow. Yeah, I've got the green button, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm pressing it, not getting it. Oh. But then when you press it, it's usually come up with like two screens. It depends on whatever you have on your background of your, I don't know how this is, but desktop or something. So you could just choose what you want to share with people. And normally it usually like bumps up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I also gave you the possibility to share the screen since I'm the administrator of the meeting, but I gave you the possibility to share the screen. Can you do this? Just pushing the green I'm, button. I'm pressing it and it's saying Dropbox. Wait, wait, so it's on basic whiteboard, iPhone, iPad, binder unknown. We'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, let's see, I'm so sorry. <sighs> if you want, you can send me the slide and then I can share the screen. All right, I'll send you the slide just to make it. I don't know why it's not working. I just switched my Zoom recently. All right. Hmm. Okay, just a sec, sorry. <clears throat> okay, I'm sending you two slides. That's mm -hmm. all. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right. 
I'm sending one then I'll send the other. Okay. So sorry. No, it's okay, Jim. Don't worry. And all these analyses can be uh, are available to anyone who's interested. I can I can send them to you. There's one that's that came out uh, last year in Co phenomenology and cognitive science that, that I wrote with Magnus. Um, okay, one more. This is it. All right, done. Again, many apologies for. Uh, I got the, it. Thanks. Okay, good. So, if we, if we could just see the first one, yeah, and just as an example of a of a completed uh, meaning of an analysis, and then I'm going to move to the second one which is a, an incomplete meaning analysis. That, and this will give you an idea of how I operate in a classroom with, in terms of teaching elucidation. Yes. I'm mm -hmm. going to open the first file you sent me. And again, forgive me my, for my incompetence, everybody. No, yeah, don't worry. So I'm going to share the screen. Can you see the screen? Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So again, I don't, you know, I said the principal, know your students. I don't know who's here right now and I don't know everybody's background. Okay. So uh, just to help you out, the, the, um, this, is, uh, uh, this is a method where we take descriptions and we break them into parts and then we elucidate them as I just described. And it comes from Amadeo Giorgi. He was the primary uh, person who inaugurated this tradition. It's been modified for, it's been going on for 50 years now. So um, am I able to scroll down or are you in control? If we could scroll down a little bit, Francesca, thank you. Sorry to make you do this. So this is the description that was just written by, uh, uh, by someone, an anonymous person about an experience where uh, she had an, a daydream. So the idea here is what's, what, what is the meaning of daydreaming? And she had an anxiety daydream about being trapped in Mexico City during the beginning of COVID and not being able to ever get home to Boston uh, in, 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 in the States. So she, in this daydream, she, gives, she describes this and I bring, if we could move up a little bit just to the start there, to the very beginning. Okay, stop here, yeah. So column one is basically uh, Ashling's description, uh, but it's a part of her description. And column two is where I, in the phenomenological attitude, okay, suspending the natural attitude, but also attending to her natural attitude empathically, and the watchword is empathy. Uh, I'm pulling out what's going on for her and re-articulating it, re-expressing it. So, in, in this kind of research, uh, you, you could call this, uh, there's different levels of, of, of what you could call this, but we're, we're, I'm re-describing it from within the phenomenological attitude. So column two is my reflective re-description and I'm and with a particular kind of focus. So then in column three, and you don't have to go this far, but you can if you want to, I do a further reflection within the phenomenological attitude, but what's essentially going on here and what's the psychological meaning of what's going on here. And here, the key is, 
you know, what's her intention? What's she up to? What's her existential project? And what is, what is the in order to, as Scott Churchill puts in his book, you know, what is the in order to, what's she up to? And when you teach this method, the students immediately start getting into uh, trying to solve problems. And they usually solve problems with uh, naturalistic explanations or diagnoses. Uh, and uh, so, and, and, they're, and, you know, they're thinking, and you have to get them out of that. You have to teach them stop, you know, uh, over-interpreting uh, and just pay attention to what's there. And the idea here is to not put in anything new, but to take out what is already there, but nascent, okay, or in its, or, or potentially there. So you're going to pull out what is, what is, uh, what is the, what is not immediately available to sight, but what can be seen from within the epoche. So the students make two types of mistakes. They'll either over explain and over interpret, or they'll just move furniture around and say the same thing over again, or just reiterate. Those are the two sort of poles. Uh, and what you wanna teach them is that the, neither one is elucidation. Elucidation is you pulling out what's essentially there already. You're not inventing anything, but you're discovering what's already there, but it, that is implicit. And your idea, the idea of Lucy is to make it explicit what's there. And the phenological attitude is all about this. It allows us to do this when you use it in an applied way. Again, like the way uh, the microscope and the telescope opens up the world for natural scientists, so does the epoche open up the social world for us in this way. So we could go all the way down to the bottom, please. Um, and what happens is, you know, when you really live intimately with this material, you can come up with uh, a really, uh, uh, you can be shocked by the situated structure you come up with. So we could go down to the situated structure. And again, so the students and I will study my own analysis. So they get the idea of how I operate, you know, how I'm doing that. Again, the watchword is how, not, not copying my concepts, but watching how I do it, like in a craft or a skill. Okay, we could stop there. So next, you know, I, I show them how I come up with a re-narrated structure or story. We call it structures, uh, but you could simply say re-narrated situated storyline uh, from within the phenomenological attitude. Re-narration within the phenomenological attitude. Again, so I see things that just are there, but are not explicit. So, I, and I'm using both my stock of knowledge of psychology and phenomenological thought but I'm also using direct intuition, paying close attention to what she's saying. So I'm doing two things. And the, so the, I'm both I'm interpreting in, term, in, the, in the sense of I'm using my background knowledge, okay? But I'm also not interpreting because I'm paying very close attention to what was in the data. And, you know, so people say, is this description or interpretation? And I think that th this, this is a dualism, okay? A very unhelpful dualism when you think in terms of the two, the two work together, okay? And uh, it's what, what, what I like the term, Miller-Ponty's term is a diacritical analysis, where I'm both doing two things at once, two approaches at once. And Miller-Ponty is very explicit about this, in many of his writings about phenomenological psychology. So I'm looking at the data, but I'm also pulling out what it means, okay? So that's the essence of a situated structure. So that's it, so we're not gonna, we don't have the time for me to go through the whole thing. But if we could just kindly go down to the general structure. So this is my re-narration. And then the general structure of an anxiety daydream is, is as such. And here, this is something that I don't ask new students to do, okay? New students can do a situated structure of a particular person's experience, but, but ask them to do a general structure, okay, of what that might be, identically what that might be for most people in our culture, in our moment of history, that's asking too much. And again, uh, uh, it, it's where uh, this, but I show them where you can go. And so I talk about how this can take me, what is the essential meaning of an anxiety daydream? Okay, What is its uniqueness? And that's again, a tentative general structure uh, that I got just from this one simple description. So I show this to them. So next, if we could go to the next, uh, uh, the next, uh, uh, point the next slide that I sent to you, Francesca, that I labeled number two. So there's a lot to discuss here, and I'm throwing a lot at everybody once. I'm just showing you an idea of how it works, just as I do with my students, without going into the details. Uh, if anybody wants to look at uh, a one of these analyses, let me know, and I'll be glad to mail them to you. 
So now I'm going to show you the uh, blank meaning unit uh, column B, where uh, and, and, which is the kind of screen that I work from with my students, where the teaching really happens. And we might have time to get into this a little bit. Okay, so we could just go to the next one. Can you see the screen? I am in the second file. I'm calling. I don't see the second one. Can I'm you still see it? I'm still looking at the first one. Okay. So. Yeah. I have to stop the sharing. I have to stop the sharing and open the second file. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. Here we go. Great. Can you see it okay. now? Yes, I can see it. I presume everyone else can. Great. So again, this is a very simple description that was yeah. uh, collected by a student. And it's a story about... Oh. Some... oh, voila. Here we go. Okay, great. Um, this is one that I can just read to you all, and and then you can see uh, how how it works, the analysis process. So it's a very brief little description, uh, and I, it's very it's very sweet. I like it very much. Um, uh, it's a every day on my drive home from work, I call my aunt to catch up on the events of my day. Monday, while we were chatting, I mentioned to her that I wanted to decorate an area of my wedding reception with photos of loved ones who have passed. I wanted to have a memorial of sorts for those who could not physically be in attendance, but I wanted my guests to remember. My aunt told, did not like this idea and says that I not do it or she would be upset. And she thought the photos would cause the guests to be sad. So after our conversation, I became frustrated I began to think about other ideas, ways I would honor those not present without it being in the face of my guests. I started to play the day out in my head. What would the guest reactions be to the fireplace mantle? Candles on the piano, would the volume even allow that? An empty chair with a sign in? Is that too harsh? I hate it. All of a sudden, my thoughts brought me back into a full, into, into full on daydream of walking down the stairs of the venue and seeing everything set up. I talked, I walked into the blue room where I had planned to set up the memorial on the mantles of the double fireplace. The memorial was nowhere in sight. The mantle was bare, only garlands as decoration. I felt an overwhelming sense of emptiness looking at the mantle, knowing that there should be something there to honor my parents, my cousins, my fiance's best friend, and nothing. I could sense that my day wasn't complete, that no matter how beautiful my dress was, that everyone had traveled from near and far, the venue decorated just right, Without the memorial, it would not feel 100% complete. Tears welling up in my eyes and feeling regretful for not doing what I had wanted to do. I was brought out of the daydream by realizing I had missed my exit in the car on the highway. When I snapped out of it, I was angry. I felt angry at my aunt for not realizing what was important to me. I felt angry at myself for not being able to stand up to her and say what I was doing no matter what. I was angry at the universe for the fact that I needed a memorial at my wedding at all. Okay, so that's the description. And so we break it into parts. And uh, you know the parts can make sense. Sometimes the meaning units, what we call meaning units, can make sense, sometimes they don't. But the point is that we have a, a blank column B. And I sit with the group and I say nothing. I say nothing, no lecturing, nothing. I'm not the teacher anymore. I just go quiet. And if we have to sit in silence, we'll sit in silence until students start to speak up and get involved with uh, filling in the elucidation for column B. And um, and it's very interesting, you know, uh, very, again, they'll often start giving natural attitude explanations. They'll start problem solving. They'll start uh, showing off what they know. And uh, it's my job to gently say, uh, uh, let's, let's remember to put all these things aside and just look at what's there. Let's try 
let's get rid of our projects to explain it. And uh, it becomes very lively. This again, where the learning happens. So I'm not intellectually, cognitively teaching the epoche. I'm showing where the epoche is happening in their responses. So every, and then, every now and then I'll get a bright student who will often lead off with a point of view that's, that's within the epoche. And I zoom in on that and I have her elaborate. And uh, she'll elaborate. Once another student gets it, then the other ones begin to get it. It's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a, a fire. And um, then all of a sudden the insight begins to manifest itself in the classroom, what this point of view is. But I need that first student, okay, who gets it to, to see, to, to describe, re-describe it from outside of the natural attitude. That's when things begin to happen. And then we start going through it and it's just fun. It's sort of like doing, uh, uh, it's like a detective crazy wall, I say, where we're pasting everything up there and trying to put it together. So it looks very linear, uh, this uh, meaning unit technique. Many people say, oh, it's rigid, it's linear, um, but not in terms of how you, once you set up the meaning unit analysis, it's a very non-linear process for how you do the elucidation. So what you've done is you've solved the problem of, you know, we, when we tell students to do qualitative research, we just, again, it's like throwing a book at them and saying, read and learn phenomenology. We say, you know, uh, here's the columns, do phenomenology. No, uh, you need help with this. And uh, it's, it's really good to, to have a group process where again, in, in a non-cognitive practical way, they can begin to elucidate these, these meanings. And, you know, I don't think we have time and I don't think the venue allows us to do this, but, you know, if we could, we would just, uh, I would ask people to give their comments on, on elucidations. And sometimes there's debates. Sometimes people will see different things. And very often, almost every time a student sees something I never saw, which is just brilliant. Uh, so there's all kinds of room for surprises. And there's some students who never get it. Uh, and you have to expect that. But most of them do grasp the idea, but it's in the process. It, it's, it's, a, it's a group dynamic process. It's a classroom process. And uh, it's, it's also simply a lot of fun. Uh, and they, memor they remember this. And the one thing they always remember from the course when we talk about it later on is A, doing interviews, learning how to do interviews, and B, learning how to do these elucidations. That's what they remember. They remember this much more than anything we read, I have to be honest. So there it is. Uh, I, I think uh, in, if I had more time, uh, we would go into details with those analyses and, uh, and we would do our own analyses together. Uh, but uh, we, we don't have the time. I just had to present the very brass idea. And again, to wrap up, the idea is that uh, we need to teach phenomenology conceptually. There's no way around that. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We also need to teach phenomenology as a practice. A model here is what they do in meditation, okay? Meditation, you can talk about meditation, you can talk about yoga, but every meditation teacher knows that all that stuff is just, you know, uh, the straw in the wind if you're not able to experience the practice of meditation. And I think that uh, the analogy, the analogy uh, to meditation with phenomenological practice is a very good one. It's very helpful. Uh, it's, you know, teaching the elucidation process is it's somewhat like teaching meditation and it can be taught. But the other thing is that you're doing is we're also teaching empathy. We're also teaching, you know, how to uh, really dwell in the worlds of other people. And so, uh, you know, there's this basic empathy, which we all do all the time you know, unconsciously, but we're taking it, stepping it up to another level of empathy here when we're asking people to imaginatively uh, inhabit the world of the other person. Another final close up thing here is uh, the biggest impediment to teaching phenomenology often is, is uh, students lack of belief in the uh, power of imagination. Uh, growing up in the natural attitude, imagination is remarkably denigrated in everyday life. We, we equate imagination with being wrong, okay, or being crazy, uh, or being uh, unpractical, or being unreal. And, you know, one of the essential teachings of phenomenology is that the imagination is just as important as perception. In fact, there is no perception that is not also imaginary, that the two co-constitute co each other. There's no purely perceptual experience that doesn't have some aura of imagination to it. 
and phenomenology values imagination. And, it, and, and you know, it's a very difficult thing to teach. We're not doing empiricism anymore, okay? And even qualitative researchers are doing qualitative research, but they're still thinking in an empirical worldview. We're not doing empirical research. We're doing phenomenological research, which is based on a whole different base uh, framework for knowledge. And in our framework of knowledge, imagination is just as important as is any tool. Okay. In fact, it's the most important tool we have. It's not just a phenomenon imagination, but it's also part of the method of, uh, of elucidating meaning and getting fuller into what something's about. All right. So let me stop and ask for questions and comments. How much time do we have? <laughs>